not only the all the papers, but it's being propped up too. <laughs> a year or so ago, I gave a talk at this camp, and I told you I had done some, or was doing some research on a very interesting topic that involved an area in which you live. And I finished that presentation up. In fact, I did a little bit today on it. But the title of my presentation is Murder in Leadville. How many people know where Leadville is? Good. If you don't, it's near White Pine, about two or three miles east of White Pine. How many of you done a little genealogical work? How many have done a lot of it? How many have wished you had? <laughs> well, when you get into it, it it's kind of addictive, isn't it? You gotta find this and then you gotta find some more, find some more, and find some more. Well, probably most all of us have a horse thief in our background that we probably didn't know was there. But if you haven't found one, you probably haven't looked hard enough. About 30 years ago, I started doing research. Back then, there weren't, there wasn't any Ancestry.com, nothing online, and I spent a lot of time at the research center there in Knoxville on Gate Street, looking through books and looking through microfilm. And I was showing my mom, usually on Sunday when I went over there, what I'd done. And I was doing research on hits. And she said, well, why don't you do me? Why don't you do my maiden name, which was Baxley? Anybody know any Baxleys? Yes. <laughs> oh Lord, that's, that's all I have to say. Well, we're probably related. My mom was Baxley, okay? And if you're going to start researching something, I wanted to know everything mom did. I said, here's some papers. Fill them out as best you can, and then we'll proceed from there. And so I came back next week. She had papers filled out to a certain extent. And I asked her questions about different people. Okay, you want to get as much information as you can about these folks. And I started doing the research and I, and I found the 1900 census. Census records are basically your starting point. We want to know where they are, their age, locations, that sort of thing. And the 1900 census, I found mom's granddaddy. And I showed her the census record here. I said, Mom, I said, there's your granddaddy and grandma, and there's all your uncles and aunts. I didn't find your daddy there. <clears throat> and she said, well, he's got to be there. I said, well, there's a person here by another name. And she thought her father's name was John J. Baxley. Well, there was a Hubert F. Baxley there, same age and everything. She says, no, that's not right, that's not right. So she gets on the phone and she calls up the White Pine, got some folks up there, and they said, he didn't like that name, so he just changed it. <laughs> now, I don't think he ever legally changed it because I went to the courthouse and looked, he just didn't like the name, so he started calling himself something else. And then I thought, if mom doesn't know the name of her daddy, how hard is this going to be for me? But anyway, another relative I asked about was this John Wesley Dawn, D-A-W-N. Any Dawns in here? Anybody know any Dawns? You're going to find out why. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a half-grand uncle to me. Now, mom told me three things about John Wesley Dawn. Number one, he got in trouble as a youth. Two, he ran away. And three, he was never heard from again. And I took that as the gospel. And time passed, many, many years passed, decades passed, and finally all this stuff started coming online, you know. I can go to Ancestry.com, I can find this, find that. And so I was working on Baxley's one day and I just happened to type his name in. I got a hit. 
caught me hit, but a hit, ain't you? <laughs> <laughs> and the hit was Tennessee State Supreme Court case murder. Well, now I know why <laughs> Mom didn't want to talk about him. We're going to flash back now. We need to say something about the war between the states. We're going to go back to 1850. Obadiah P.R. Fox. Anybody know any foxes? Okay, lots of them. Obadiah P.R. Fox is living with his father and his mother, and a few years later moves to Jefferson County. Obadiah marries Elizabeth Falver in 1853 in Dandridge. And by 1860, they've got two kids, a Thomas and a Martha. They live near the confluence of Jefferson County, Hamlin County, and Sevier County. And that's where most all of this happened. That's where the three counties meet. By 62, he moved out of Jefferson County into Hamlin County. Now, I know this because the tax record said, quote, left county, no property. Now, we'll go into a little sidebar. There's a lot of sidebars in this. Things I learned while I was doing this research. At this time, taxes were levied on land, lots, slaves, other property, state, war. There was a tax on the war. And the county taxes and railroad taxes. Now, railroad came through in the 1850s, so they still levying a tax on that. Now, if you didn't own anything, you would have to pay 35 cents for a state tax. 10 cents for the war, 65 cents for the county, and 15 cents for the railroad for a total of $1.25. cents. That'd be your taxes for the year. All right, Obadiah is now living not far from the Noachucky River on Flat Creek. Anybody know where Flat Creek is? Yeah. When I first started doing the research, I was on the long, wrong Flat Creek. There's Flat Creeks everywhere. And the one we're talking about, there's the East Fork, the West Fork, and they converge right down to the Nola Chucky, do they not? All right. All right, Obadiah's father-in-law joined the Confederate Army, and he was in Knoxville. And in the fall of 62, he served about three months, and then sent home on sick furlough. Probably died in late 62. Now, the father-in-law had two sons that joined the Union Army in late 63. And I thought about that then. The father was a member of the Confederate Army. He passed and then his sons joined the Confederate Army, or the Union Army. You know, I think there's a story there probably. What happened? They changed their allegiance. All right, January 63, Obadiah joined the Union Army in Cobb County, Tennessee. Served as a private, Company C, 8th Regiment, Tennessee Infantry. Company commander was Captain Bible, regimental commander was Reeves. Now, why did he join the Army? Well, 1860 <coughs> census said he's a laborer, owned nothing of value, and he was not a wealthy man. So was he a Union man, or did he join for the $100 bounty? 100 bucks was a big, big amount of money back then. I don't know. A lot of foxes, though, joined the same day he did, and I feel they're probably all related. All right, Obadiah answered roll call for musters for the next eight months. And then the next seven months, he's listed as being in the hospital at Lick Creek Bridge in Green County. <coughs> Lick Creek is located within a few miles of Mollsheim. You know where Mollsheim is. Now, he was admitted then to General Hospital in Knoxville in April of 64 for treatment of acute diarrhea. Don't you just go ahead and eat. <laughs> and, and then he was sent to the General Hospital for treatment of flesh wound to the left ankle, which he accidentally received. That little step. Because are they saying he accidentally shot himself in the ankle? <laughs> Maybe that was a way to get out of duty or something. I don't know. But he was granted a 30-day furlough in May, sent home to recover. And it was not uncommon 
uncommon to be sent home to recover if there's someone to take care of you that relieved the army of doing so. Uh, he did not return for duty after the expiration of his furlough. So he remained at home sick. In December of 64, Obadiah died at his home in Flat Creek of causes unknown. And that raised another question for me. I bet there's a story there that will never be told. Right, the Flat Creek we're talking about is in the southwestern corner, or southeastern corner of Hamlin County. Obadiah was buried at St. Paul Presbyterian Church Cemetery. How many people know where St. Paul Presbyterian Church is? All right. Well, I have a picture of the church here and some pictures of his stone that is there. I'll just pass those around. talking to Wayne some time ago he said his folks are buried there in that cemetery so they've been burying people there for a long time now his headstone was delivered between 1879 and 1903 to Wits Foundry does Wits area ring a bell okay and that was within two miles of the church a little sidebar on the Presbyterian Church the church is located about one mile south of the intersection of I-81 and 160. It was founded in 1804 at Flat Creek. Now, evidently, there was or is a community called Flat Creek by the creek of that name. The first building was built of rock. The present structure, built a short distance away, is built of brick in 1857. Still has regular church service. Anybody go to church there? Has ever anybody ever been to church there? Okay, good. All right, Obadiah's dead. His wife is left on her own with three children to support. In March of 65, Elizabeth files a widow's pension application. She's going to draw $8 a month for herself as a widow, plus, she's going to get $2 for Thomas. Martha and Obadiah Jr. until they reached the age of 16. Now during this time these three children would could be considered orphans if the mother could not afford to take care of them. And that's something I didn't understand when I first started doing research. You could be an orphan by the court yet your mother was still alive. if your mother cannot afford to support them. All right. If not, they'd go live with someone else. Elizabeth dies shortly thereafter. In August of 66, one year and eight months after her husband, she dies. And I believe, but I do not know for sure, she's buried next to her husband at St. Paul's. Now, I believe this because she died within two years of her husband. She lived in the same area. There's an unmarked grave next to her her husband. Why, why would she be buried anywhere else? And the only reason Obadiah had a stone is because the government furnished it. Right. Alexander Sharp, who lives in Leadville, is appointed a guardian for the children. Actually, there were three different people that kept the children. And the federal Pension records at this time are not called the Civil War. The pension records were called the War of 1861. Interesting. Another sidebar on pension applications. Now the applicant has to get after Davis to prove marriages and births. One interesting after David came from Esther McClister. You know any McClisters? At that cemetery, there's a lot of them buried there. And visiting there, they had some prominent stones. But Esther was, was 72 at the time that this affidavit was taken. Now, she stated she had been a midwife for 40 years and that she had officiated at the birth of, of Obadiah and that she had put the first dress on him. 
That's right, back then, both boys and girls wore dress the first few years of their life. Now, she also officiated at the birth of his three children and that his wife, Elizabeth, moved in a short time after the birth of the youngest child onto her farm and lived within sight of the residence until the death of her husband. All right. We're now going to focus on one of Obadiah's children, and that will be Martha. She's living with the Sharp family in the 1870 census. She's 10 years old. Eight years later, she marries Charles H. Givens. Anybody know him Givens? Okay. <coughs> Jefferson County. I next found her in the 1880 census, living with her husband and daughter, Rosa and Newport. And she also had a son, Carl, born in 1880, and little Martha, born in 1889. So by 